احمده و نسلی علی رسوله الکریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته سوره بني اسرائيل بس 26 الله سبحانه وتعالى after explaining the rights of Allah belief in oneness of Allah and after being kind and merciful and obedient to the parents the right of parents Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordaining to fulfill the rights of the relatives and give the relatives his rights and also the poor and the traveler and do not spend wastefully so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here explaining and ordering the rights of the relations of kin the blood relations the relations due to the womb of the mother dil qurba we mean the relations of the kin are near and dear relatives quran in more than one verse multiple verses and multiple surahs of the quran explain as the rights of the relations of kin over all of us verse number 83 of surah al-baqara allah highlights and explains a covenant which was taken with the people of bani israel and these are the 10 commandments which were given to hazrat musa alayhi salam allah says wa if akhadna mithaq bani israila la ta'buduna illa allah wa bil walidayn ihsana wa dhil qurba wal yatama wal masaqin wa qulu lin nas husna allah says remember what with allah accepted a solemn pledge a covenant from bani israel worship none but allah and do good to your parents to the relations of kin to the orphans and poor and speak kindly to all the people then in the first verse of surah an-nisa we already gone through that and if i revise it was said wattaqullah allazi tasaaluna bihi wal arham fear allah in whose name you demand your rights from each other and the bonds and ties of the relationships of kin then in verse number 27 of surah al-baqara Allah while talking about the disobedience the fasikun at the disobedience Allah says who are they allazina yanqizuna ahdallahi min ba'di mithaqihi wa yaqta'una ma amara Allah bihi an yusala wa yufsiduna fil arz ulaika humul khasirun these are the people who are the losers so these disobedience who are the losers they do what allah says who break the bond with allah who break the covenant of allah and then they do what they swear what allah has ordered to be joined what has allah ordered to be joined the relations of kin and what allah has forgive for, forbidden to be severed is the bonds of the relations of the blood relations and the relations of the womb and then in verse 90 of surah nahl allah has highlighted the three do's and the three don'ts of quran and allah says 
There is absolutely no doubt that Allah enjoins upon you number one justice, doing good or ahsan and spending that is generosity towards your fellow beings and Allah forbids you what is shameful and Allah says the other three things are told which are the don'ts of Quran. So these are the highlighted three do's of the Quran. And then in the verse number 177 of Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah highlights the concept of being virtuous, the concept of being of piety is what Allah says that true piety or true virtue is not turning your faces towards the east or the west, but the true piety or the true virtue is one who believes in Allah, the day of resurrection, the angels, the revelations, that is the book of Allah and the prophets. And the concept of piety and the concept of virtue as for the definition of virtue and piety after belief, Allah says what? And he spends his wealth for the love of Allah. Upon whom? Upon the relations of kin, for the orphans and for the needy and for the poor. So now, if I sum up the message of all these four or five verses which I have recited and which I have translated, I think I can, and you can, all of us, we can summarize that if we want to fulfill the covenant or the pledge of Allah, we want to come up to the level of a God-fearing person. And if we want to obey the do's and don'ts of Allah, and if, if we want to be virtuous and if we do not want to be one of the disobedience, then what do we need to do? We need to maintain the bonds of the king. We need to be kind. We need to be generous. We need to be helping. We need to be caring. We need to be loving. And we need to be merciful and good to the relationships of kin. Now, I will be, I will be reading out and I will be narrating a few hadiths of the Prophet wasallam to make us understand how important it is to maintain the relations of kin and how how very very important it is to stop and to refrain from severing the relationships of kin. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who reported in Bukhari that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Qal Allah ta'ala man wasalaka wasaltuhu man qata'aka qata'atuhu Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah the Rahman says that I shall keep connection with who keeps connection with the relationships of kin and I should severe connections who severs the connections of kin. Similar words are also reported by Hazrat Abdul Rahman bin Auf anhu in Abu Dawud and he says that Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the mother's womb in his hand and he addressed it and he said 
that I am the Rahman. I am Rahman, the merciful. And this Rahima, that is the womb of the mother, Allah named it as a Rahima. This is connected with me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Man wasalaka wasaltahu, man qata'aka qata'tuhu. Whoever will join you, I shall join him. And whoever will break you, I shall break him. When Allah comes to join somebody, he can join him with his blessings, with his bounties, with his Quran, with his guidance. And when Allah comes to break, or when Allah decides to severe somebody, he can cut off his sustenance. He can cut off or he can severe him from the source or from the root or from the channel of guidance, from the connection of Quran. So this is the importance of maintaining the relations of king. And then Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Hazrat Jubair bin Mut'im radiallahu ta'ala anhu they report in Bukhari and Muslim that the Prophet said, La yadkhulul jannata qati'un Whoever violates the rights of kinship shall not go into the, into the paradise. La yadkhulul jannah if Prophet ﷺ has told us that, that the person who is going to sever the relations of kin will not be allowed or permitted to go into Jannah, do you think he'll be able to enter the paradise? Hazrat Anas ta'ala and who reports in Bukhari in Muslim that Prophet ﷺ said, whoever wants to increase his sustenance, I suppose we know that everybody would want to do that. Whoever wants to increase his sustenance and that the marks of, it, of his feet remain for a longer time in the world, that is, he lives long. So if somebody wants to increase his sustenance and his worldly, worldly wealths and riches and he wants to have a long life, what should he do? He should be kind and he should be helpful towards his relatives. So relatives and the relationships of kin they are who are responsible and who will be decisive of whether we will be permitted to enter to Jannah, how long we will live and how much of sustenance will we be, will we be blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who narrates in Bukhari that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling us the way one has to maintain the relationships of kin is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the one who joins ties is not truly the one who reciprocates a kind act of the relative but the one who joins the ties is who joins the ties even when the other severs them. So we, if we are just reciprocating then this is not actually maintaining the bonds of kin. Prophet ﷺ was asked that tell us the deeds which will take us to paradise. And he said, feed the poor and hungry, join the bonds of kin, promote the salam and offer the salah when people are sleeping. When? Salatu tahajjud then you will enter paradise. So maintaining the relationship of bonds will help a bondsman enter paradise and any person who is going to severe the relationships of bond, la yadkhulul jannah. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who narrates in Muslim that the Prophet sallallahu was asked by a person one of his issues in his dealings with his relatives, he said, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have relatives. Now, you must have a keen ear to what I'm going to tell you because this is an issue which many of us might be facing. So he said that, O Messenger of Allah, I have relatives with whom I try to keep in touch, but they cut me off. 
I treat them well. But they are, they are abusive to me. And I am patient and forgiving towards them. But they insult me. Now kindly instruct me what should I do. The narrator says that Prophet has advised that if you are as you say, meaning that you, whatever you are claiming that you are behaving in this mannerism, then if it is actually true, if you are as you say, then it is as if you are putting hot ashes in their mouth. And Allah will continue to support you as long as you keep on doing this. And similarly, in Tirmidhi, there is a hadith that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what is the way of, he was asked, that what is the way of saving our hereafter? And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the person who asked that, you maintain ties with the one who severed it with you. You give it to one who deprived you and you forgive the one who wronged you. So this is actually the mannerism and this is actually the level we are supposed to maintain the relations like. In a hadith narrated in Bukhari, Prophet said, whoever believes in Allah and the day of judgment should maintain good relations with his relatives. So it is a matter of perfecting our belief and faith also. There's another hadith in Bukhari when Prophet said that a Muslim is not allowed to abandon or to severe relationship with his Muslim brother for more than three days. So it is not permissible in Islam. And then another hadith Prophet said that if a Muslim severed ties with another Muslim brother for a year, that is for full one year without any rhyme or any reason they are not on talking terms. Then Prophet said it is as if they have shed each other's blood. Did we realize how, how important it is and how forbidden it is to sever these bonds? In another hadith, Prophet said two Muslims who have severed their relationship. When they meet, the one who proceeds in Salam will be closer to the blessings, bounties and pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the one who proceeds with Salam and lets go his, all his, the thing he was angry on and the thing they were fighting with each other about. And then there's a beautiful promise of the Prophet ﷺ in a hadith that he said that when two Muslims, they had sowed their relationships of kin with each other, then the one who settles the quarrel, he will be rewarded with a palace. Imagine, he will be rewarded with a palace in the heart, in the center of the Jannah. Allah says, وَصُلْهُ خَيْرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all understand all this. Help us all remember all this. Help us all believe all this. Help us all act according to all this. So it was, it's not just the words of the hadith which is going to tell us all this. I'll be narrating some incidents of the Prophet ﷺ sunnah as well. How did he behave? And how did he relate with his relations of kin? We see the Prophet ﷺ praying for his relatives. He used to pray for Hazrat Hamza anhu to embrace Islam. He used to pray for his uncle Hazrat Abu Talib to pray to accept Islam. And then his, his cousin his paternal cousin, Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas, who was the son of his uncle, Hazrat Abbas, who he prayed for him. And so many, so many times did he pray for them. When he was born, Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas, when he was born, his mother came and she put the baby 
laid the baby in Prophet Sallallahu lap and then he prayed for him. Allahumma faqihu fid deen. Oh Allah, bless him with the knowledge of the religion of Islam. Then when Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas with his father migrated from Mecca to Medina, on receiving them, Prophet Sallallahu hugged him tight, held him close to his chest and he was he was supplicating, Allahumma faqihu fid deen. Oh Allah, bless Abdullah bin Abbas with a deep sighted knowledge and comprehension of Islam. Then a night when he was staying with the Prophet ﷺ at his home, he got up at the time of Salat al-Tahajjud then, then he held him close to his chest and he prayed, Allahumma faqihu fid deen. And you know what? The supplications and du'as of Prophet ﷺ for Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas were accepted and he was called as the Hebrew Ummah, the scholar of the Ummah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is what we need to do for our relatives, pray for them because you know the best, the best gift a Muslim brother can give his Muslim brother is the gift of a dua, the gift of a prayer or a supplication. Then Prophet was so loving and caring and kind and protective and tolerant and merciful to his relatives. I I can narrate that incidence of the Prophet with one of his uncles after the Battle of Badr. In the Battle of Badr, there were 70 Makkans who were killed and there were 70 who were taken captives. And one of them being the uncle of Prophet Sallallahu Hazrat Abbas Raziallahu Ta'ala and who he had not accepted Islam till then. And the companions narrate that it was the night after the battle that we were we were observing that the Prophet Sallallahu was not comfortable. He was restless. That is he was just turning and tossing and couldn't just sleep. And we asked him that what was the matter and why was he so upset? And Prophet ﷺ said that it is because I am I'm getting upset because I I am listening to the moaning and the cries of my uncle Abbas and they are making me restless and upset. I would stop here. I would stop here and and tell you who he was. An uncle, an uncle whom Prophet ﷺ had been inviting for belief and for faith and had been inviting him towards Islam for the last so many years and he had rejected the invitation of his nephew. Not only this, that he had not just accepted the invitation of Prophet ﷺ for embracing Islam, he was among his bitter enemies. From all the way to Mecca, he had come with the Meccan army to fight to actually fight with the Prophet ﷺ, his companions. This uncle, when he is crying and when he is upset, Prophet ﷺ is upset and he can't sleep, he's sleepless. We just need to stop and think, what are we doing? Where do we stand? Do we know? Do we know who of our relatives is upset? Do you, do you or I, we know or we try to find out or are we aware of who amongst our relatives of kin have been crying through the night? And if, if we know that any of our relatives is upset, then how upset are we? How sleepless have we been because of the anxieties and tensions and distresses of our relations of kin. And then we claim, we claim to be the people of the Prophet ﷺ. We look forward to the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ on the day of resurrection. Prophet ﷺ was so upset and the companion said that what we did was that we just let Hazrat 
Abbas loose and we opened up all the chains. And then obviously he stopped. Immediately did the Prophet ask, he inquired, why is he silent now? And the companions told that thinking about your discomfort and your being upset and your anxiety and your sleeplessness, we've released him and we've opened up all the chains. Now remember, what justice, what remarkable justice Prophet said and he ordered. Now either you chain him up or you let loose or you let loose all the prisoners. This is a remarkable justice. And then what happened the next morning, Hazrat Abbas Raziallahu Ta'ala and who was all injured and bleeding and all his clothes were torn. So the Prophet asked the people of Medina, anybody to give him his clothes. But he was very tall and nobody's clothes would fit him. And has Prophet Sallallahu uncle was given his clothes by Abdullah bin Ubay, the leader of the hypocrites, because he was tall also. And then you know what happened? After quite a few years, when Abdullah bin Ubay died, his son came over to the Prophet Sallallahu and he requested him to give his shirt for the coffin and for the funeral of his father, fearing about his father's hypocrisy and fearing about his life after, he asked, he requested the Prophet Sallallahu to give his shirt and Prophet Sallallahu took off his shirt. And there was Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and he said, Oh Prophet Sallallahu are you going to give your shirt to a person who was a hypocrite, who was the leader of the hypocrites? Prophet said, Oh Umar, don't you say that. You know, Abdullah bin Ubay gave his shirt, gave off his shirt to my uncle Abbas when nobody's shirt would, would fit him. What is this? This is open heartedness and open mindedness. And this is acknowledging the goodness and the kindness of a person and not just only acknowledging and accepting and mentioning and talking about the kindness of somebody but in fact repaying and returning the kindness of the person who was kind to us and more so Prophet wasallam is trying to repay the kindness of a person who was kind to his relatives even what are we doing? There are times in our life when we get so, when we get so hard hearted and we get so tight. Allah said, We get so tight hearted and so narrow minded that we we stop acknowledging what kindness anybody has done to us. Let aside repaying the kindness, we don't even we don't even have the heart to accept, to acknowledge, and to mention the kindness somebody did to us. This is the model of excellence of the Prophet. And then I read about the conquest of Mecca when Prophet is riding the camel, the she camel, and he was entering Mecca. Can you imagine who was sitting behind him? This was like one of the biggest days, the biggest success in the life of the Prophet Eight years after migrating from Mecca, he is walking in as the conqueror of Mecca. Couldn't have been a bigger achievement. Couldn't have been a bigger day of success for him. And behind him on his sheikh camel is whom? The son of Hazrat Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and who his paternal cousin. This is the message of what and how we are supposed to relate to our relatives. 
and we see in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam him giving importance to his paternal relatives. Conquest of Makkah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in his house, the house of Hazrat Umm Hani radiallahu ta'ala anha and she walks in and she talks to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and explains her situation that she has given shelter to one of the few Meccans but, but her her brother Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who he has taken out his sword and he's hanging them on their heads and he's saying that he's going to cut off their heads he's going to behead them and help me because I have I have given them promise I promised them to give them shelter Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said whom Ummehani has given shelter we have given shelter we shall provide shelter to the person whom Ummehani has promised to provide shelter teaches us the importance of women in Islam Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had the patience had the time to listen to a Muslim woman he had patience he had the time he had the tolerance this was like and this might have been like one of the most busy days of his life but he had the patience and the tolerance and he gave enough the time to listen to listen to his she cousin and he would honor her he would respect her there are so, so many incidences in the life of the Prophet ﷺ when he is being seen giving importance to his paternal relatives. But today, very, very pathetically would I highlight that moms of today, what they are doing is that they, they try to pump their children against, against her in-laws Believe you me, this mother, this mom who is pumping their children against her in-laws in envy, in hard feelings, is the worst enemy of her children. The mother, the mom who develops a feeling of hatred, who is developing and who is instilling hatred in the hearts of her children against her grandparents, their, their paternal grandparents, the sole purpose of whose life is now to pray for their, for their grandchildren. The worst enemy of the children is their mother who is poisoning their minds and their brains against the paternal aunts and uncles, the sincerest relationships on the earth. Where can we get sincerity? Can you buy love out of money? And then we see the Prophet ﷺ not only relating to his maternal or his paternal relations of kin, we see him being good and kind and polite even to his in-laws. Hazrat Isma radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was his sister-in-law. And there's so many times when he used to go to her house, he used to advise her, he used to instruct her. There, there, there's an occasion when he's talking to her at this mind, he's, she was spending and she was taking out the money from her kitty and then she was, then she was counting the remaining and then she was counting what she was going to give. And Prophet Sallallahu instructed her to be generous. Stop counting. Allah will stop counting and stop stopping. Allah will start stopping. So instructing her to be generous. Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar, Hazrat Isma radiallahu ta'ala anha was the sister of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and she was uh, Prophet sallallahu sister-in-law. And then Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was the brother of Hazrat Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha and the son of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he was the brother-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu we find so many times that he is coming over to the house of his sister and visiting the Prophet ﷺ and we, we go through a, a hadith in Bukhari when Prophet ﷺ was asking him to start reciting, to start offering the Salatul Tahajjud. And then in Bukhari we see 
We read of an occasion when Hazrat Maimuna radiyallahu ta'ala and has nephew Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas is staying over for the night when Hazrat Maimuna radiyallahu ta'ala and has was she was having a turn of the Prophet sallallahu staying at her place. So this is the open-mindedness. This is the love and this is the justice and this is the kindness with all the relatives. Allah Help us remember all this. Help us remember the importance and help us believe the importance of all this. Help us adopt all this. Help us adopt all the do's and help us stop ourselves and help us refrain from all the don'ts. Help us be merciful and kind and polite and soft-hearted and generous and sincere and loving and, can, and caring and merciful to all those relatives around us. And in the last part of the verse, Allah is explaining what do not spend wastefully. Wala tubazir tabzira. And this Allah explains again in verse number 27. Why shouldn't we be wasteful? Why shouldn't we do tabzir? Innal mubadzirina kanu ikhwan shayateen. Indeed, the wasteful are the brothers of devils, and ever has shaitan been to his Lord ungrateful. So, in the verse number 26, the last part of the verse 26 and the verse 27. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates two, two manners of spending that is israf which is extravagance and tabzir which is even more than extravagance that is wastefulness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah al-araf has clearly ordered Ya bani adama khudhu zinatakum inda kulli masjid that, O children of Adam, attend to, you, attend to your embellishments at every time of prayers and eat and drink. So dressing up, taking up adornments, eating, drinking, nothing is prohibited. Eat and drink, but do what? Be not extravagant. Why? We earned all that. Why can't we decide how do we need to spend? Do not be extravagant. Why? Surely he does not love the extravagant. Israf. Israf is the first step towards wastefulness, and this is what? Extravagance. And tabzir is the next stage. It is heightened and a superlative form of extravagance that is wastefulness. Because of israf, a person will lose and will be devoid, deprived of the love of Allah. And because of indulging in tabzir, a person will get the friendship and the company of whom? Of shaitan. Now, we need to understand what exactly israf and tabzir is. Because to be able to label and to be able to understand the cut off value beyond which if we spend, it will be entering the limits of tabzir and israf. Israf would be to go beyond the general limits of the society observed by the middle class. Because you know, in all periods, according to the scientific development and according to the periods and the necessities and the amenities of life, they go on changing. What they were two centuries before, we are much more advanced. So in all the times, the middle class of the society strives and lives according to the basic amenities which are needed for us and trying to exceed beyond the middle class standard just to set an elitish standard is what this is what is israf and uh, i would uh, recall a story in the an incident in the life of uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
there was a companion. He had built a, a two-storied house. Whereas in Medina, when everybody else used to build single-storied houses, and that was the norm. One day, Prophet Sallallahu he passed by his house and he asked whose house was it. And the companions told whose house this double-storied house belonged to. After some time, when Prophet Sallallahu was sitting in the mosque, the companion whose uh, house he had seen was a double-storied house. He came and he greeted Prophet Sallallahu and said, Assalamu Alaikum. But Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not return his greeting. Why was this? Because when Allah has set his limits and if someone crosses them, Allah does not love that person. And so Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also stopped showing love to the companions as well. So we this lead... Uh, we learn from this is the criteria of whom we need to love and whom we do not need to love. Whom Allah loves, whom Prophet Sallallahu love, we should love. And whom Allah and Prophet Sallallahu did not love, we should not show love to. The companion was very upset and uh, he tried to find out what the reason was. And all those companions who had known what the reason was, they told him. And when the companion found out he had gone against Allah's will and his Prophet Sallallahu being extravagant, so he immediately went back and he demolished the upper story. This is the perfect example for all of us to nip the evil in the bud because we can never pinpoint exactly when a bad deed starts to take root and to begin and to grow in something much bigger. So it is best to remove the thing right at the onset. So anything that goes beyond the standards of middle class in a society to become luxurious, to set an elitist standard is what? It is israf. And what is tabzir? Tabzir is an escalated form of israf itself. And that can be explained by another example. See if there are a lot of people sitting in a hall, but the hall is only half full. But what is happening is that all the lights and all the fans and all the electrical appliances of all the hall, they are turned on although it's not needed. So this is what? This is Israf. But now, if the people who were sitting in the hall, they leave, leaving all the lights and the fans and the electrical appliances and ACs switched on, they would be indulging in tabseer. Leaving the tap running while we're brushing our teeth is Israf. And leaving the tap running while nobody is around is definitely tabseer. Remember, all these resources of water and electricity and fuel, these are all the blessings. These are all the blessings from Allah that we are accountable for. And if you look around, there are so many examples, so, so many examples of Israf and Tabzir openly. And then people doing, indulging in Israf and Tabzir and Making, making fun of it, enjoying it, announcing it, highlighting it, and making pr feeling proud of it. Weddings in our society go beyond israf, fall definitely into the category of tabzir, luxurious jewelries, unnecessary designer, designer bridal dresses, excessive lavish foods, expensive photo shoots. This is tabzir. This is not only tabzir, but it is also haram to be carrying on all this before nikah or on the, on the days of nikah. This is not precedented by the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam itself. Verse number 28, and if you must turn away from the needy, awaiting mercy from your Lord, which you expect, then speak to them a gentle word. So in this, Muslims are being taught to turn back the needy with kindness and grace instead of harshness and cruelty.
and do not make your hand as chained to your neck or extend it completely, thereby becoming blamed and insolvent. Indeed, your Lord extends provisions for whom he wills and restricts it. Indeed, he is ever concerning his servants acquainted and seen. Verse 31, and do not kill your children for fear of poverty. We provide for them and for you. Indeed, their killing is ever a great sin. Killing of children is clearly stated here as what? Kana hrit an kabira, a major sin, a great sin. This term of hrit an kabira has not been used anywhere else in the Quran. So we can clearly gauge how heinous this act is by the verdicts of Allah. And do not approach unlawful sexual intercourse. Indeed, it is ever an immorality and is also an evil as a way. In this verse 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling all forms of zina as unlawful. And uh, zina, remember, is not just by a physical actual physical relationship, but it may be in other forms preceding that also. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Bukhari and Muslim, that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah has written the son of Adam, his portion of adultery, which he will in, inevitably commit. The adultery of the eyes is the lustful look. The adultery of the tongue is the lustful speech. And the soul craves and yeans, the passion will affirm or then will deny. Verse number 33, and do not kill the soul which Allah has forbidden except by right. And whoever is killed unjustly, we have given his heir authority, but let him not exceed limits in the matter of taking life. Indeed, he has been supported by law. So Allah here says, uh, killing of the soul has been forbidden except by right. So when is it right is and when it, is it permissible to kill somebody? There are five instances where taking somebody's life is permissible. Number one, kisas. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered in Surah Al-Baqarah, the death penalty of taking life for life. Number two, rijam, as explained in uh, Surah Nur, the stoning to death of the married adulterers. And the third is murtad, the person who turns away from Islam after accepting it. Fourth is an offender who wrecks havoc and creates fitna and fasad. And fifth is the enemy in battlefield who is fighting the Muslim forces or who is trying to fight back the Muslims. So these are the five conditions in which five instances in which it is permitted to kill a soul. And do not approach the property of an orphan except in the way that is best until he reaches maturity and fulfill every commitment. Indeed, the commitment is ever that about which one will be questioned. Verse 35, and give full measures when you measure and weigh with an even balance. That is the best way and the best in result. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also mentioned in Surah Mutafifin, the destruction, woe, or the one of the deep pits of the hellfire is for all, for those who do what, who are dishonest in their dealings and would give less weight when they are selling, but they would expect full weight when and honesty when they are buying. And do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. Indeed, the hearing, the sight, and the heart about all those one will be questioned. Allahumma hasibna hisabi yasira. Verse number 37. And do not walk upon the earth exontly. Indeed, you will never tear the earth apart and you will never reach the mountains in its heart and that it is evil. Its evil is ever in the sight of your Lord detested. So here, a detested, detested deed is what? Arrogance. 
the verse is narrating and word a verse is uh, negating and explaining the dislike of arrogance as allah has said inna hu la yuhibbul mustaqbirin there is no doubt that allah does not love those who are what who are arrogant Allah says he does not love all those who are what mankana muhtalan fakhura those who are boastful and those who are those who are arrogant and then Allah says wala tamshi fil arzi marha don't walk arrogantly in the earth and then Allah orders wala tusa'ir haddaka lin nas Allah says don't turn your face towards people and Allah explains o surah mu'minun the gate of the believers the humble servants of Allah yamshuna ala al arzi hawna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has explained that a person who has arrogance equal to the seed of a mustard will not enter jannah and allah has clearly announced alaysa jahannam mathwa lil mutakabbirin isn't jahannam is isn't hell fire the best the blessed place for all the arrogant people and how what which state of affairs will these arrogant people be like in hell fire prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam narrated that all those who were arrogant in this world they will be raised as tiny ants by the lord on the day of resurrection and they will be forced towards the bolus and when the companions asked what bolus was prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that it was a low line pit of the hell and there they will be forced to drink tinatul khabal and when he was asked was tinatul khabal was he told that this was this was the blood the plus and the fluid draining from the wounds of the inmates of hell and gathered in bolus astaghfirullah rabbi min kulli zambin wa atubu ilaik and that is from what your lord has revealed to you of wisdom and o mankind do not make as equal with allah another deity lest you be thrown into hell blamed and banished then has your lord chosen for you having sons and taken from among the angels daughters indeed you say a grave saying and we have certainly diversified the contents in this quran that mankind may be reminded but it does not impede the disbelievers except in aversion say if there had been with him other gods as they say then they each would have sought to the owner of the throne away exalted is he and high above what they say by great sublimity the seven heavens and the earth and whatever is in them exalt him and there is not a thing except that exalts allah by his praise but you do not understand their way of exalting indeed he is ever forbearing and forgiving and when you recite the quran we put between you and those who do not believe in her after a concealed partition and we have placed over their hearts coverings lest they understand it and in their eyes deafness and when you mention your lord alone in the quran they turn back in aversion we are most knowing of how they listen to it when they listen to you and off when they are in private conversation when the wrong doer say you follow not but a man affected by magic look how they strive for you comparisons but they have strayed so they cannot find a way and they say when we are bones and crumbled particles will we be truly resurrected as a new creation say be you stones or iron or any creation of that which is greater which is great within your breast and they will say who will restore us say he who brought you forth for the first time then they will nod their heads towards you and say when is that say perhaps it will be soon and the day he will call you and you will respond with praise of him and think that you had not remained in the world except for a little and tell my servants to say that is which is the best indeed shaitan induces in, induces among them indeed shaitan is ever to mankind a clear enemy 
Your Lord is most knowing of you, and if he wills, he will have mercy on you, or if he wills, he will punish you, and he will not have sent you over them as a manager. And your Lord is most knowing of whoever is in the heavens, and the whoever is in the heavens and the earth and we have made some of the prophets exceed others in various ways and to daud alayhi salam we gave the book of zabur say invoke those you have claimed as gods beside him for they do not possess the ability for removal of adversity from you or for its transfer to someone else those whom they invoke seek means of access to their lord striving as to which of them would be the nearest and they hope for his mercy and fear his punishment indeed the punishment of lord is ever feared and there is no city but that we will destroy it before the day of resurrection or punish it with severe punishment that has ever been in the register inscribed and nothing has prevented us from sending signs except that the former people denied them and we gave samud the she camel as a visible sign but they wronged her and we sent not the signs except as a warning and remember when we told you indeed your lord has encompassed the people and we did not make the sight which we showed you except as a trial for people as was a as was a curse the tree mentioned in quran and we threatened them but increased but it increases them not except in greater transgression and mention when we said to the angels prostrate to adam they prostrated except for iblis he said should i prostrate to one you created from clay iblis said do you see this one whom you have honored above me if you delay me until the day of resurrection i will surely destroy his descendants except for few allah make us one of those few Allah said, go, for whoever of them follows you, indeed, hell will be the recompense for you, an ample recompense. A'uzu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Verse 64, an insight to senselessness, whoever you can among them with your voice and assault them with your horses and foot soldiers and become a partner to their wealth and their children and promise them. But shaitan does not promise them except delusion. Indeed, over my believing servants, there is for you no authority, and sufficient is your Lord as a disposer of affairs. So Shaitan asked for a limit of time to effect all the children of Adam, to misguide them, to make them go astray from the path to Jannah, so that he could stop them entering Jannah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the period. And this is the dialogue which occurred between Allah and Shaitan at that time. And from here, we gather that Shaitan doesn't work alone. He has an army. He has an army from amongst human beings and from jinns and from evil spirits. They all aid him in his dirty works. And he forms an organized team. And the cavalry of the shaitan in these days is what? In the day and in the ages of today is what? It includes all the, all the TV, the media, the literature, the indecent literature, the internet, the mobile screens. These, these alls, these are paving the way for shaitan to enter our lives, to enter our houses and homes and to affect us and our families and our children and our offsprings. And how, how does shaitan take part out of our wealth, out of our time and our children? Because you know, Allah, Allah, the provider, the sustainer, he provides us. He provides us and blesses us with wealth. But, but every bit of the money, every each and every bit of the money that is spent 
for israf, in excess, in tabzir, out of boastfulness, out of riya, exhibition, demonstration, or all the money which is spent on unlawful things like drinking, gambling, dancing, any forms of all, all unlawful activities. This is the share shaitan takes out of our wealth. Shaitan takes time out of our, takes his share out of our time. How does he do that? All the time, all the time that is spent in front of the TV or the mobile screens, chatting, Facebooking, interneting, peeping into the people's life, gossiping, and then time on the TV screens, movies, films, music, dramas, all forms of vulgar scenes is what? Shaitan is taking out all the time. And then out of the children, Allah blesses the parents with healthy, sound-minded children who are what? Who are the followers, are supposed to be the followers of Prophet Sallallahu who are the individuals of the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu who should turn out to be the teachers and the preachers of Quran, who should turn out to be the Mujahideen of Islam, who should, uh, who should turn out to be the protectors and helpers of the oppressed Muslims of the Ummah. But, but all these children only given the worldly education and they are not taught to develop a bond with Allah and they are all fed on acts of disobedience towards Allah in the name of liberalism. All the children being taught, being taught music and dancing, how to play guitars and all the children liberated this is what shaitan is taking out the share from all the children. It is your Lord who drives the ship for you through the sea that you may seek of his bounty. Indeed, he is ever, he is ever to you merciful. And when adversity touches you at the sea, lost are all those who invoke except for him. But when he delivers to you, he delivers you to the land, you turn away from him. And ever is man ungrateful. Then do you feel secure that instead he will not cause a part of the land to swallow you or send against you a storm of stones, then you would find yourself, you would not find for yourself an advocate. Or do you feel secure that he will not send you back into the sea another time and send upon you a hurricane of wind and drown you for what you denied? Then you will not find for yourself against us an avenger. And we have certainly honored the children of Adam salam, and carried them on the land and sea and provided them of the good things and preferred them over much of what we have created with definite preference. Mention the day we will call forth every people with their record of deeds. Then whoever is given his record in his right hand, Allahumma ja'alna minhum, those will read their records and injustice will not be done to them even as much as the thread inside the date seed. And whoever is blind in this life will be blind in hereafter and more astray in this way. And indeed, they were about to tempt you away from that which we revealed to you in order to make you invent about us something else. And then they would have taken you as friends. And if he had not strengthened you, you would have almost inclined to them a little. And then if you had, we would have made you taste double punishment in life and double after death. Then you would not find for yourself against us a helper. And indeed, they were about to drive you from the land to evict you their form. And then when they do, they will not remain there after you except for a little while. That is... That is our established way for those we have sent before you, our messengers, and you will not find in our way any alteration. Verse number 78 of stanza 9, Allah orders, establish prayer at the decline of the sun from its meridian until the darkness of the night and also the Quran of dawn. Indeed, the recitation of dawn is ever witnessed. Now here, 
in verse 78, Allah is reinforcing the times of the prayers. We know that in Mecca, there were two prayers made obligatory, one for the day and one for the night. But on the 12th year of prophethood after Miraj, there were five obligatory prayers. Now, after making five prayers obligatory at the night of uh, ascension, Prophet was uh, instructed about the timings of Salah. Remember in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has just indirectly explained the timings of Quran. Not directly has Allah instructed us about the precise detail of the timings of Quran. Only indirectly has they, have they been indicated. But from where do we get the timings of Quran is from Hadith and from Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It has been narrated by Hazrat Jabir bin Abdullah anhu, that the very next day after Miraj, Hazrat Jibrail alayhi salam, the instructor of Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, the very next day he came down and the first day, and he taught him the timings of all the five prayers. The first day, Hazrat Jibrail alayhi salam, he came on the starting time of all the five prayers. And the second day, he came on the ending time of all the five prayers and then he said the time between these two is the time of the prayer is the total time interval of the prayer and as we learn from the words and the traditions of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has that the jibrail alayhi salam had instructed according to the time of the sunrise and the time of the sunset and the sizes and the directions of the shadows. Like we learn that the time of the sunset was the ending time of Fajr and the time of the sun, uh, sunrise was the ending time of Fajr and the time of sunset was indicated as the starting time of uh, Maghrib and then the time where uh, midday, after midday was the starting time of Zuhur and the time when the shadows, size of the shadows would increase to equal to the size of the object, it was the ending time of, um, of Suhar and the time of um, the, the time when the shadows would be equal to the size of the object would be the starting time of Asr and the time where the size of the shadow would be double the size of the object would be the ending time of Asr and so on and so forth. So this is how we learned the timings of the different uh, Salat according to the sunset, sunrise, midday, and the sizes of the um, shadows. Now, another thing which we need to learn from here is that this was the total time period which was instructed and explained. But in this total time interval of all the five Salah, we learn from the traditions of Prophet Wasallam that there is for every Salah a time of excellence. The time of excellence of the Salah is the time. If the Salah is ordered at that time, the reward will be maximum for that Salah. For example, we learn from the Sunnah of Prophet Wasallam that Fajr, Asr, and Maghrib, the time of excellence is closest to the starting time, meaning that if all these three prayers are ordered, are offered as close to the starting time, the reward will be maximum. And then uh, regarding the Salah of Isha, the reward is maximum the later it is ordered. And uh, obviously for people who are tired and fatigued and who are sleepy, they need to offer it early to uh, ensure that their concentration is proper and they do not divert and they are not sleeping. Wherever uh, we do learn other things about Salah also from here, that uh, we learn that throughout the day, throughout the day, there is time for any Salah or the other. May they be the obligatory or may they be the supererogatory Salah. For example, we learn that the last time for Zuhur is the first time for Asr. And when the time of Asr finishes, the time of Maghrib starts. When the time of Maghrib finishes, Isha starts. And the last time of Isha has been labeled as either the midnight or the last two third of night and from there starts what 
the time of Salatul Tahajjud. And the time of Salatul Tahajjud, it carries on till the Azan of Fajr. And the time of Fajr then continues till the sunrise. And after the sunrise, after the sunrise is the time of the three supererogatory prayers we would also need to know of. And these supererogatory, uh, three supererogatory uh, salahs, they are collectively known as Salatul Zuha. Salatul Zuha, the first is the Salah of Ishraq. The time for Salah of Ishraq, it starts almost about half hour after the sunrise and the total time period is about one to one and a half hour. After the Salat of Ishraq is the next, is the Salah of Jasht. And the Salah of Jasht, it is starts, the, start, the time starts after the ending of Ishraq. And this again has a total time interval of about one to one and a half hour. And then after this starts the time for Salat of Avvabin, and this continues for an interval of about one to one and a half hour. So these three are uh, proven by the Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, they ha have a great merit and they have a high reward. Inshallah, I'll be talking of them in future also. And uh, um, we need to remember one thing at least, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He is our sustainer, He is our provider, He is our creator and very mercifully, He has not only provided for us our basic necessities like clean water and pure air and basic food and clothes and shelter, but he provides us much, much more beyond our basic requirements. As he himself says in Quran, So what I feel from the core of my heart is that we need not only to offer only our obligatory prayers, but at least one or two supererogatory prayers also. Few supererogatory fasts and something beyond zakat in form of charity in the path of Allah as a gratitude of all the blessings which he has blessed us beyond our basic natural requirements of life. And uh, um, I would also want to explain another thing that uh, as I've explained, that throughout the day, there is time of any one or the other salah, may it be the obligatory or the supererogatory salah, but then there are three times of a day, after the sunrise, before the sunset, and slightly after the midday or noon. These three times or hours of the day are the times when salah and prostration is prohibited. As Prophet ﷺ very clearly said, sun sets between the two horns of shaitan. So refrain from prostrating in these hours. It is because those, all those who worship the sun, they used to prostrate in these hours of the day at the time of sunset and at the time of sunrise. Because you know, at uh, this time, firstly, the sun is slightly cool, and it is easier to fix the gaze. And moreover, the sun is very impressive. And they used to bow down and prostrate to the sun in these hours. So uh, Allah, Prophet Sallallahu has forbidden all of us to prostrate and to offer salah in these hours of the day. And here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in, uh, in the last part of the verse 78, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Quran al-Fajri, why? Kana mashhuda. Inna Quran al-Fajri, kana mashhuda. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is ordering us to do what? To recite Quran at dawn, that is after the Salah of Fajr. Now, why one must recite this Quran after the dawn, at dawn, after the Salah of Fajr, because the first reason, recitation of the dawn, as the verse itself Allah explains, the recitation of the dawn is witnessed. Kana mashhuda, witnessed by whom? By the angels. When they, they are shifting their duties, we know that angels present overnight till Fajr and dawn. And when they depart towards the sky, a new batch of angels, they descend. And they stay from dawn till dusk. And both these witness 
Allah's bondsmen reciting the Quran and both sets of angels record these deeds and they are presented before Allah. So we need to recite at, uh, at dawn after, after Salat of Fajr. And moreover, this is the best time. There is privacy, there is space, we are free, there is no noise, there's no disruption, there's no disturbance whatsoever. And then uh, reciting of Allah's book right at the start of the day. This will pave the way towards a blessed, wholesome day. And right at the start of the day, it will recharge our Iman. It will boost our faith. And then last but not the least, it will be a source of a very powerful reminder for the day, a message for the day. So this is... Uh, what Allah mentions. And then in verse number 79, Allah says, and from the part of the night, pray with it as an additional worship for you. It is expected that your Lord will resurrect you to a praised station. <coughs> this is in order of what? Of a supererogatory salah of the night, that is Salatul Tuhachat. We know that, as I've already mentioned, that there were two prayers in the period of Makkah, the prayer for the night and the prayer for the day. But when in the night of Miraj, the five prayers were made obligatory, this Salah of the Hajjot, that is the night prayer, was made, was made super erogatory for the rest of the bondsmen. But Prophet Wasallam continued to pray it regularly, even till the last days of his life, when he was very, very sick and bedridden. Even then, he did not leave his Salat of the Hajjud there. And his uh, Salat of the Hajjud used to be that uh, he used to sleep and then he used to get up uh, after midnight or after the two-third of night. And his routine was that he used to pray eight rakats in pairs of two. And he used to finish it off with a vitr prayer of three rakats. And this would, uh, this cumulated to 11 rakats of Salat of the Hajjud. And Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha narrates that the beauty with each every rakat of prayer was offered by the Prophet وسلم, was that where he would alternate reciting between Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Imran and Surah Nisa and Surah Maida in the night prayers and his feet would swell up and his heads would tear and they would blood would start trickling down from standing upright for so long. And when they asked him, why do, why do you work so hard when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you with Jannah? He would reply, should I not be a grateful servant of Allah? So to be grateful to Allah, as I've already mentioned, we need to offer at least some supererogatory salah, some supererogatory fast, and some charity beyond zakat also. And then the hajjud, by the strict definition as the root word hajim dal, it means what? To get up after breaking the sleep. To get up after sleeping is what we mean by hajjada. So the hajjud, by the strict definition of the word, implies uh, a supererogatory salah, which is offered by a person when the person gets up after sleeping at night. But there is no doubt, and I would definitely request that all those people who are still up and who are in a habit of staying up late or who are awake at that time of the night should not just quit it because they won't come up to the divination. Remember, they should in any case offer few nawafil to avail of this blessed time the time for which Hazrat Abu Huraira and who reported that Prophet Sallallahu said that our almighty Lord descends to the lowest heaven in the last one third of every night. And he announced it, who is calling upon me that I may answer him? Who is asking from me that I may give him? Who is seeking my forgiveness that I may forgive him? So all those who stay up who are awake at that part of the night, even if it may not come up to the definition, strict definition of the hajjud, but they should avail and they should offer a few nawafil, inshallah, the taste 
and the 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 blessings which they are going to receive from offering these salah will inshallah get them habitual to tahajjud also verse number 80 and say my lord cause me to enter a sound entrance and to exit a sound exit and grant me from yourself a supporting authority this is a supplication which was taught to prophet sallallahu a whole year before his migration and it was accepted in the best way because he exited mecca and he emigrated Makkah with honor. He entered Medina with honor and was given the most supportive companions in form of the Ansar of Medina. So this dua and this supplication taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his beloved prophet before he started a very big chapter of his life and how it was accepted and granted. So this supplication is crucial for all of us. We should recite it at every important beginning or turn of our life. May it be um, the start of our uh, marriage or a new business or a job or any new deal we are going to start with. Verse number 81, and say, truth has come and falsehood has departed indeed falsehood by nature ever bound to depart and these were the words on the prophet on the on, the, on prophet sallallahu when he entered at the time of conquest of mecca but remember this promise this promise was made in the 12th year of prophethood, one year before the immigration of Prophet Wasallam, when the opposition and the persecution by the Meccans was at its peak. And at that time, any sort of victory seemed too good to be true. Like the Muslims could not in the wildest dreams imagine that this would happen. But Allah all Noor, who knows the knowledge of the future, he promised all that and his promises are no doubt the truest. And we sent down of the Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers, but it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. And when we bestow favor upon the disbelievers, he turns away and distances himself. And when evil touches him, he is ever despairing. Say, each works according to his manner, but your Lord is most knowing of who is best guided in way. And they ask you about the soul. Say, the soul is of the affair of my lord and mankind have not been given of knowledge except a little and if we willed we could surely do away with that which we revealed to you then you would not find for yourselves concerning it an advocate against us except we have left it with you as a mercy from the lord indeed his favor upon you has ever been great say if mankind and jinn gathered in order to produce the like of this quran they could not produce the like of it even if they were to each if they were to each other assistance and we have certainly diversified for people in this quran for every kind of example but most of the people refused anything except disbelief and they say, we will not believe you until you break open for us from the ground a spring or until you have a garden of palm trees and grapes and make rivers gush forth within them in force and abundance, or you make the heaven fall upon us in fragments as you have claimed, or you bring Allah and the angels before us, or you have a house of gold, or you ascend into the sky, and even then we will not believe in your accession until you bring down to us a book we may read. Say, exalted is my Lord, was I ever but a human messenger and what prevented the people from believing when guidance came to them except they said has Allah sent a human messenger say if there were upon the earth angels walking securely we would have sent them we wouldn't have sent down to them from the heaven an angel as a messenger say sufficient is Allah as a witness between me and you indeed he is ever concerning his servants acquainted and seeing 
and whoever Allah guides, he is the rightly guided, and whoever he sends astray, you will never find for him protectors beside him, and we will gather them on the day of resurrection, fallen on their faces, blind, dumb, and deaf. Their refuge is hell. Every time it subsides, we increase them in blazing fire. Allahumma ajirna min nar that is their recompense because they disbelieved in our verses and said, when we are bones and crumbled particles, will we truly be resurrected in a new creation? Do they do not see Allah who created heaven and the earth is the one able to create the likes one of them? He has appointed for them a term about which there's no doubt, but the wrongdoers refuse, but the wrongdoers refuse nothing except disbelief. Say to them, if you possess the depositories of the mercy of my Lord, then you will, then you would withhold out of fear of spending. And ever has man been stingy. We had certainly given Musa alayhi salam nine evident signs. So ask the children of Israel about when he came to them and Pharaoh and said to him, indeed, I think, O Musa, that you are affected by magic. Musa alayhi salam said, you have already known that none has sent down these signs except the Lord of heavens and earth is an evidence. And indeed, I think, O Pharaoh, that you are destroyed. So he intended to drive them from the land, but we drowned him and those were with him all together and we said after pharaoh to the children of israel dwell in the land and when there comes the promise of hereafter we will bring you forth in one gathering and with the truth we have sent the quran down and with the truth it has descended and we have not sent you except as a bringer of good tidings as a warmer and it is a quran which we have separated by intervals that you might recite it to the people over a prolonged period and we have sent it down progressively say believe in not believe in it or do not believe indeed those who were given knowledge before it when it is recited to them they fall upon their faces in prostration and they say exalted is our lord indeed the promise of our lord has been fulfilled and they fall upon their faces weeping and the quran increases them in humble submission say call upon allah or call upon the most merciful whichever name you call to him belongs the best names and do not recite too loudly in your prayer or too quietly but seek between them an intermediate way and say praise to allah who has not taken a son and has had no partners in his dominion and has no need of a protector out of weakness and glorify him with great glorification allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 110 instructs the best way to offer our salah where our tongue is softly reciting the words of the Quran and the mind is constantly engaged and the ears are hearing what has been spoken softly, the entire body becomes captivated and this, and this attention is what incorporates humility in the prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accept our prayers, help us, help us with humility and help us take out any forms of arrogance and help us adopt gratitude and patience in our life. Allahumma ja'alni sabura wa ja'alni shakura wa ja'alni fi aini saghira wa fi ahyunin nasi kabira. Rabbana la tuzay qulubana ba'da iz hadaytana wa khablana min ladunka rahma innaka antal wahab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastakburuka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Amin summa amin.